So uh, yeah, let's uh, now let's uh, move into the unified communication. So how this uh, all the work we did here fits into the UC world. So yeah, uh, first of all, um, as uh, as we said uh, before, you know, unifying we have we, we need to have something to unify. So in this case, uh, the first need is to to be able to let's say bridge a lot of uh, non uh, session uh, chatting. Uh, um, uh, to uh, MSIP, so it, and then we can unify all the services. So, um, as mentioned, we have uh, to the MSIP channel. Uh, after that, uh, we are the ending of the session on the MSIP side. Um, uh, or if there is to do your own mapping between the SIP and the uh, message and the MSRP. Um, in a similar way, um, we can uh, we can have the uh, OpenSIPs exposing uh, for the MSRP UA and uh, API. So whatever external application can actually uh, interact. Now uh, in terms of MSRP with maybe with this. it's about uh, the code distribution. How you distribute all the. Images. And over to you, Aaron. All right. Uh, my name is Aaron Sam. I'm founder and CEO at WebRTC Ventures. Audio only WebRTC applications, and we have a couple slides that I may or may not get to talking about integration with SIP and telephony as well. So you can definitely think broader than that, but know that in my mind, I'm often thinking about video. Ten plus years ago, we were told that WebRTC was going to be simple. Uh, there were some jokes made in the panel yesterday about WebRTC being free, question uh, mark. Of course it's not, because there's a lot of work that has to go in to building these things. Uh, but the way that it was originally sold to us is as, uh, and, and is still certainly true in certain use cases, a peer-to-peer -peer way to exchange video and audio and data with nothing in between except for a signaling server to help establish that RTC peer connection. That is a great model for, for many scenarios. Uh, however, there's a lot of other things that you do have to consider in most production applications and absolutely if you're doing any form of scaling of your application. And those include stun and turn servers to help establish those peer-to-peer -peer connections, but also uh, many other features that you may be including, things like recording and broadcasting, larger group chats, all really require you to have an architecture more from perspective, and particularly, you still have to think about all aspects of the infrastructure, the DevOps, the hosting around that, and that's gonna be where you're gonna spend a lot of time uh, from a scaling perspective with any open source media server choice. And there are a lot of great choices to look at. On the open source side, these are a few. And then the fourth general architectural choice is CPaaS, again, when I talk about a communication platform as a service, I'm thinking primarily around the video side, but many of them have telephony features built in as well, SMS, et cetera, recording your stuff, right? So, the, so you're, you're stuck with however they envisioned building that feature. And there are a lot of great providers here as well uh, to use. We've, we've worked with all of these. And so really this, is, this first part of the architecture is very much about different trade-offs that you want to make. So you have to think first before you're scaling your application. It's, it, it's not just, you know, does this scale well or not? It's, well, what, what does that mean to you? What are the different things that you care about? And generally speaking, when we're talking, especially as a services firm, talk property. Uh, I think Alan mentioned someone, I don't remember who, but who made a, a company that made a very good exit on his list being built on Twilio the whole way. Well, that's great. Uh, that they were able to do that. Obviously, they didn't have the intellectual property around that part of their core service, and in that case, that worked out great for them. In other cases, your, your <coughs> venture capitalists are going to want you to own more of that. Maybe that drives you towards them, or cheap, or it'll make more sense why. Uh, and MCU will mix all of the audio and video on the server and then push a single stream of that combined video out to users, whereas an SFU each participant pushes up 
one, uh, one copy of their video and audio, and they get back one stream for every, every other <coughs> participant on the call that they're in. So that's why there's more processing power required on the clients for peer-to-peer -peer group video chat. But it's being used in broadcasting scenarios a lot now, so we, because of the very low latency of WebRTC connections. So now that means we have to have a lot of horizontal scaling of the SFUs built in. Uh, if your goal is instead to build large group video chats, and why you would want to talk to 100 people at once, I don't know, but people regularly ask for this sort of thing, right? And they seem to all believe that we can act like that, in it, right? So really think through the flow of the application, and that will affect and hopefully reduce the burden of what you need to do in implementing it. Uh, and then here, here's a telephony slide, so this can get, and Alberto, who, who made this slide, would say that, well, this looks more complex, it's, it's actually much simpler. So there's a lot of things to consider here when you're scaling, thinking about integration with system, other systems like VoIP legacy systems, recording, voicemail, speech transcription, uh, how exactly you want to do multi-party video conferencing support. And then you also, a couple, last couple slides here, which I really won't dive into, but I'll encourage you to check out Alberto's discussion of that in the recording more later, talking about handling things uh, when, as you're horizontally scaling, how do you make sure that you do that in a or 100 person conversation, because those are not equivalent load on the server. So all of that needs to be considered as well uh, and handled very carefully, and the only way you're gonna handle that uh, is with significant load testing. Uh, to figure out what those parameters are and then test them. So, and there's other things coming too that'll be in the recorded version, uh, like the AV1 video codec that can help some of this. So, anyways, I'll keep it short there. Uh, if you have any other questions around this, I'm happy to talk with you about it today, or you can contact us team at WebRTC Ventures, and I'm also happy to connect you with Alberto for more SIP talk. Excellent, thank, thank you, you so much, Aaron. Joel, if you can come on down and uh, give your present. Ah, there you are. I was trying to see how you Oh, yeah. No problem. for IoT security. Uh, it's in connectivity to their iPads, bootstrap connectivity, meaning that they can use Trufon's connectivity to persons, users can use Trufon's connectivity to buy other plans from other uh, connectivity providers. So, but in fact, what's, the, what's next for uh, unleashing the IoT potential uh, and for sure, the, the business potential of IoT. Uh, according to the European Commission, uh, the Internet of Things are key, exactly in, the, in ensuring the resilience of networks, and as well as, as keeping data private and secure, right? Uh, however, uh, the, the, the complexity of IoT networks uh, also bring the need to more robust security frameworks for IoT. And that's exactly what I... I would like to start by talking today exactly of a project that we are working on, funded by the, the European Commission, funded by Horizon 2020, probably some of you already know it. Um, it's on autonomous trust, security, and privacy. In fact, uh, uh, in the last si slide, I will bring uh, an answer to this. Uh, first of all, starting to, to discuss a little bit the, the, the purpose of using the SIM as a secure element, I would like to, to, to recall to you guys that the SIM exists since 1991, right? For securing subscribers' identity and, and authentication in cellular networks. Um, in fact, when Trufon was born in 20, uh, 2001, already al almost 1 billion SIMs were already provided and were already used for, for security purposes, for identity and for authentication in, uh, in cellular networks. And in 2021, in fact, uh, the number of SIMs are beyond the number. 
um, some of the of the work that we have been doing uh, is exactly on zero touch authentication of IoT devices in third party services. When I say third party services, is uh, a watch connecting directly to AWS or to Azure or uh, uh, an health sensor connecting to a, a, a private cloud. Uh, so a way of ensuring that the identity of a given device is that the one from that device it, itself. So I'm sorry, probably the, 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 the words are too small, but some context regarding the authentication right, of IoT devices in third party services. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the IoT growth calls exactly for security, as I mentioned. One of the parts of security is exactly authentication, uh, which is a main requirement for most IoT devices, or it should be, or IoT uh, services. Uh, a specific requirement is that most IoT devices are constrained devices and third party services like AWS, uh, Azure, or any other uh, service. In fact, the, the, what we propose is you, you can see in this image. The first step that you see there is exactly the authentication of the device in the, in the cell network, that is the, the one in the top left. Um, after being able to authenticate, in fact, what we is secure because, in fact, we leverage processes that are well proven uh, and based on standards. And it's quite scalable because it doesn't have any effort in the manufacturing time to the manufacturers of IoT devices. So regarding the second part that I would like to, to talk to, to you about a little bit is on the, the at the beginning when the, 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 the device uh, is turned on, for instance, we generate a key pair in the SIM uh, where there is a private and a public key and we, we provide the, 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 private, the, the public key to the, the, to the key management system and keep the private key that signs these payloads in a reputation system for a device that informs if a device is trustworthy or not. If not, it can trigger some protection actions for the data that is there. And it is quite, this is quite in interesting, for instance, for uh, non-cooperative devices, right? Devices that are compromised but are not cooperative and we can act on that uh, uh, through the... And that's it. Uh, questions are for after, right? For during lunch. So that was excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. We're getting back on time, yay. So did you, please, come on down. So when I gave my presentation at the start, one of the things I was talking about is um, you know, the evolution of the industry uh, and the importance of data insight and proof is a really interesting example. I, the company comes from a team that has a long history in uh, the uh, telecoms industry. For Verizon, that was 11 years ago. So I took a bit of a detour from the telco world and um, I built a couple of companies, sold my last one to proof last year. Uh, that's why I'm here. So I'm going to do my best to try and impress you here. So the bar is pretty high after all the very um, detailed technical presentation. This is probably going to be the most non-technical presentation of the entire conference, so apologies in advance for that. Um, so, you know, I took a detour, but then having been an outsider for a little bit, it uh, gives you perspective, right? And so, you know, the perspective that I would like to share here is that, and look, I'll be honest, I had to go research CPAS uh, when <laughs> Alan and I first talked, what the hell is CPAS? Uh, but I did my research, you know, there's something called Google, but then I said, hold on, um, let's just take a step back and think about, you know, the world we live in. And here's, here's a couple of observations, right? So how do we bridge that disconnect? That's where we feel humbly that we come in. And the, the presentation that I just heard from Truphone, we are kind of in the same zone here. I feel, and again, I'm obviously biased here based on what I do, but the growth enablers here to connect this disconnect is really identification, authentication, proofs and claims. That is how we, we feel that we can bridge the, the communications versus commerce 
disconnect because digital economy is what we are all. That's you know that's that's what makes us go around, right? It's all about the money. Um, so you know the the using this key. Okay. Now I know again what you're thinking. Oh, that's another bullshit marketing slide. Okay. But my mind is that you want to show your company. Um, we have about a thousand or so enterprise customers. Um, we um, we have been in this journey by iterating. We used to be called Payphone, and I invested in in this company. Now we are called Proof. What do we do? Um, I, I no, I'll send the slides. But I would say two main things. Right? Again, think of yourself as a consumer. Uh, the the first um, exposure you have. Um, you know, to a commerce experience is when you're trying to open an account, open a bank account, apply for a credit card, um, you know, sign up on a portal to prove your vaccine status or any sort of digital onboarding where you have to prove who you are. How do you do it today? Right? The most common experience, unfortunately, you know, events like changing your password, a wire transfer, so on and so forth. So identity and authentication is basically what we do as a company. How do we do it? Um, like I said, we are different from most other players, and this is a nice continuation from the previous presentation. Uh, we believe in hardware roots of trust, right? Um, go ahead and download the white paper, which we just published. Instead of the entire presentation, by the way, so you know, enjoy it while you can. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the key here, uh, sorry for the pun, but you've probably been following the whole passwordless um, movement bandwagon now, especially with iOS 16. We will have pass keys. Wow, that's amazing, right? You're now going to be able to have passwordless um, access to to digital, I mean, to, to 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 sites on the internet without having to, you know, your FIDO token, Face ID. Think about it. You know, for the first time, Apple now really wants to know who you are. They want to know the person behind the Apple ID. Why? Because that is opening the gates for Apple. Uh, for, for Apple Wallet, for Apple Cash, for the BNPL Play, as Apple wants to get into commerce, it's not good enough for them just to have an association of device and Apple ID. They need to know the biological person behind that now. Only then they can do commerce. Otherwise, you can't do commerce if you don't know who's the human being behind the Apple ID. That is a big shift which is happening this year with passkeys. So again, that's the site. You can learn more. A quick detour is the only reason you should consider a SIM is if you want to make a commerce play, 2004 to Verizon. And he said, thank you. You are one of the very few who is not asking for money. I said, no, don't bother. <laughs> Obviously, when we went to LTE, we went to SIMs and, you know, now I'm feeling, hold on, we are going back in time. We are going back to a non-SIM world. What's the difference? I feel like... I feel like we have matured as an ecosystem. Let me ask you this question. How long, how long has happened, right? We are like, look, if we know, we know. If we have the SIM card, if we have the AMV chip, if we have a hardware root of trust, we know for sure. That results in a monetary benefit, okay? Industry average for fraud in digital onboarding is 40 basis points. If you look across all the various players, credit card companies, banks, thousand plus enterprise clients, and you know all the usual suspects. They all use us in a slightly different way. Okay, uh, the big banks obviously want to know everything. They'll do it their way, custom, all PII. They want everything. They store everything. They have custom models. The smaller players who will like, yeah, just tell us how to do it when you check check the box. There's obviously the web team. I mean, the whole the Twitter deal was almost fell apart because Elon Musk said there's too many bots who are not real people. Think about that happening in almost every other aspect of the economy. All right? we, have, we have a lot of non-humans pretending to do commerce. So, we, we, so that should be a quick check, human or not. Uh, proofs and claims. Sometimes I don't need to know who you are. All I need to know, are you above the age of 13? Are you above the age of 18 to buy alcohol? Are you a resident of Nevada because that's where I can sell cannabis? I don't need to know your address. I just need to know a bit of information based on your attributes. Sometimes I don't need the attributes. If I need to ship you at proof and I'm in the early stages, 
being very candid, but this is a great time for us to brainstorm, right? So, you know, some of the pillars, and that's my last slide. I'm, I'm calling this the identity bridge from Web 2 to Web 3. In fact, I don't like the word Web 3, uh, but people use it, so I feel like I'm forced to use it. What I'm really trying to do is my API, right? The last thing, again, which is part of why I'm here, is that this is, this is, this is going to be the new company within the company. L2 is what we're calling it. Self-serve, no enterprise, no salespeople, so no marketing bullshit. The API will be out there for you to try to use and obviously paid. They will be, you might have a freemium model, not sure exactly what that will be yet, but uh, want to start the process of, of engaging and having conversations directly with, you know, with the developer community, like Pipilio obviously has done very successfully. We are going the opposite way. We did, it, right? we did the enterprise thing first successfully, and now we are going to the developer world. But uh, that's pretty much my presentation. If you have if you have questions about what we do today, so just prove prefill, prove walk, prove variety, go to our website. If you have questions about L2, I'm the guy. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, we finished on time. So that was great. Thank you to the uh, presenters for uh, finishing that up. Uh, Tricia is bringing the food up as I speak, so we'll get the food here in a couple of minutes. So rest, relax, and we start again at one o'clock, okay? Oh, yeah, no, I was just
Said it was this morning. You know, big bang told you it's going to be fine. Get back upstairs. Then it's going to happen. So, hey, thank, thank you so much. No, it's no, no, great. Right. Excellent presentation. Okay, thanks. Thanks. So we'll see. If that works yeah. great. If not, then it'll be like for another time to say work out whether it's your gateway, your firewall. Or the ISP is doing something mm -hmm. weird because this is intentional. Is what's happening? Is it intermittently breaking yeah. the uh, connection? Yeah. Because so, it'll say, "Actually, yeah. see here." Yeah. yeah, it's not receiving enough. Oh no! Now it's receiving data faster than real time because it's blocking the connection. Okay. So everything buffers, it opens the connection and again. Then just boom. Okay, yeah, I understand. That was really weird. Yeah. It is what it is. But it looks sure so there. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> nope, boots yeah. great. Everybody's enjoying it, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Joe had the right idea, he went first. <laughs> 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 Well, even what kind of connection are you using? I'm just using Wi Fi. Yeah. It's Wavecom. Wavecom Wi Fi? No, no, yeah. GoCom. It's GoCom. GoCom. Same as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. And I, I have this box. I will need a, um, a USB as well. This doesn't have Ethernet. What do you think? Well, this was. So that I, because I don't have Ethernet, I need a USB connection. To, uh, oh. Way, way, way more. And what's happening is the, the stream is being interrupted. So you'll see. Let me show you on the stream. The stream is excellent. Then it'll go. It's not receiving enough. Something is and then it, um, no data, it's not receiving anything.
Oh yeah, we had one viewer. Oh, oh stream finished. It just gave up. Oh. Yeah, because it just what happens is it blocks it. It blocks it for so long that YouTube just goes, okay, you're not streaming anything anymore. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, this is the streaming app, mm -hmm. and it's running fine. It shows the audio levels. Mm. It shows the rate of streaming okay. app. So everything's good there. And then YouTube just gave up. I tried. Oh. Here you go. That's it. My, my face is amazing. <laughs> I know, because you didn't know we were being videos. Yeah. <laughs> because if I knew, it would be really better. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> See you? So you're well, emoting with the problems. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My expressions are too real. <laughs> Anyway, um, right, so, it's, yes, wait a minute. No, 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 this is, I don't understand what's going on here. This is showing the old video. Well, they had their chance. Yeah. Uh, I don't no. They have friends. Exactly. They're still a, they're still a problem. They're still a flight here. No one's on. With a burger that everyone wanted in the burger. I, uh, well, he might find the burger's lost. You know, it just disappeared. Yeah. You know, it was a quantum burn burger. Yeah. Okay. Still One. One. Yeah, One. we start again. Yeah. Great. So, see if you don't need anything you need, just what's up there. Yeah. Perfect. Oh yes. Um, yeah. Thomas. He's feeling ill today, oh. but he left these. Okay. So he's at his Airbnb at the moment. I said I'd leave this with you and you either leave it in reception. Oh yeah, I can leave it in reception and just pass by. Oh, thanks, Mike. You are very lucky, you know. That is so interesting. disappear. I'm shocked. Trustworthy. <laughs> I will. Thank you, Patricia. Sounds good, yeah. 
yeah, just make sure you're happy with your, because not everybody uses Jitsi. Um, so getting the screen share, you know, so sharing the slides sometimes with Jitsi can be. Well, first to the ball because the person was Estonia where it wasn't covered by the US. But now I've got a decent one, just a couple of years. Very well. We're surviving. I just need to make sure I've got more. got this one more session to go. So in the three remote sessions we've got, uh, two are going to be from Tobias. He sent me two presentations which were like, well, I want both of them. So we're doing a back-to-back. -back. And then after uh, Tobias, we will have Vish from Dell. And he's going to be presenting a new BS version of uh, 5G. So uh, as he has many times before, come in and presented a uh, Quite an interesting uh, view uh, from the industry side, but with a uh, heavy dose of uh, no hype. So, Tobias, thank you so much. Looking forward to your presentations. Over to you. And how that um, really makes global deployments manageable. Um, I believe you've heard quite a bit um, earlier today about eSIM. I'm going to touch upon that as well and how the two uh, kind of interrelate, but I want to focus on <clears throat> this architecture that Twilio, uh, where I'm at now um, as a, a product marketing um, manager, um, really has has been spearheading, and it's an it's an approach to um, IoT SIM cards that um, really makes it easy for any um, business that needs to scale globally and scale fast. So we have a lot of customers um, in the growth segment, a lot of startup customers that have built successful businesses on top of our connectivity. Um, and again, many of you might know Twilio as um, a messaging provider. We've definitely evolved um, since the early days. Um, and, um, you know, Twilio since 2016, roughly, has uh, been working in the um, cellular IoT connectivity space as well. Uh, besides other things, uh, such as um, customer engagement technologies and customer data. Um, <clears throat> it's 8 a.m. where I am. Um, this is the first time I'm actually uh, speaking out loud. 
I hope my voice holds. Um, I got my coffee here, I got water. So uh, let's dive right in. <clears throat> so the question, uh, things like, will I be able to have just one SIM as in one SKU, one stock keeping unit to, to worry about that I can put into all of my devices? Is there a single API I can work with to integrate the management of my SIMs into my workflows? Networks. So having the ability to choose exactly which networks per country you actually want to uh, enable for your devices. Um, that's also important as you uh, will learn over time which regions you know, of a country. SIM, 3FF micro SIM, 4FF nano SIM, I actually have one of uh, those here on my desk. So this is the Twilio product called SuperSim, which comes in the triple punch um, you know, form factor, but also as an MFF2, which is an embedded SIM, which is even smaller, which you would use for uh, connecting to um, you know, cell towers um, in the countries they're deployed in. So we're dealing with two different SIM cards here from two different providers. We got um, uh, Green SIM, up here, uh, GreenSIM has an IMSI on it. IMSI is an international mobile subscriber identity. Um, and these IMSIs are essentially your passport, your keys to accessing certain networks. And that could be a single network, um, or it could be dozens or hundreds of networks. Um, that is kind of defined in you know what, what you signed up for, what you purchased, uh, what your agreement is to what you have access. So in this case, the green IMSI um, you know, access the home. Um, the breakout to the internet is local nearby, which gives you low latency, but also gives you um, the data sovereignty that you might need uh, in terms of your, your business requirements, your data requirements. Um, but what's important to understand is that, you know, these mobile devices, uh, mobile cores um, can behave uh, slightly differently. Uh, towards your devices. So there can, for instance, be configured different timeouts um, for getting con connections that you need to accommodate. <clears throat> we have the same green SIM, that's the idea, right? A single SIM now. We're in kind of single SIM territory now with, with the SIM types. Um, same SIM connecting down here, um, now no longer to a home network, but to a visited network. And the MZ in this case, um, you know, doesn't just give me access to one network, it gives me access to, to many, which is why it can connect to the visited network. But the data path goes back to home territory. So if this was literally Australia, your data would go through, in this case, the US-based um, server and um, break out to the internet there. You have no access to files. That's really what's new. Typically, one SIM holds um, one SIM profile, and that's it. With eSIM, you can load uh, multiple on your eSIM, but only one can be active at a time. But you might have still multiple um, agreements, multiple relationships uh, with carriers. Not you might, you will. Now there are two um, standard architectures with eSIM that the GSMA defined. One is called M2M, machine to machine. Uh, the other one is called consumer. There, there are key differences between these architectures. So it's important to understand uh, just the SIM profiles and manage and decides, you know, or not decides, but which kind of, um, yeah, manages and owns the um, activation of different profiles on your device. That now sits on the device itself. And <clears throat> so let's look at how eSIMs connect. Now we're dealing with a single SIM card, single SIM hardware that holds. So what are the advantages of eSIM? One SIM to procure, but again, dealing with many carriers. Um, now, MVNOs might step up and um, work on shielding you from that complexity, uh, maybe consolidating different bills into one, things like that. But you're still 
you know, there's still a level of complexity involved here um, that you have to deal with. And sometimes you even have to pay for the dormant profiles. Remember, only one can be active, but you might have a monthly charge for a dormant profile, so you need to check for that. So there's cost implications. You're still dealing with different molecules. cores. You still have that problem I explained earlier. Yeah, and I touched uh, the possible cost for the dormant profile. So it's still not ideal. So finally, let's look at multi -MZ. What is that? It's essentially the idea of having a single SIM card that doesn't um, house multiple SIM profiles, but it, it houses one, but that profile has more than one MZ. At Twilio, the super SIMs that we sell um, have four different... What about the molecule core? Well, with the multi-MZ architecture, you have the flexibility to connect to different mobile cores um, wherever you find yourself. And the way we've architected that at Twilio is we have deployed, we own our own mobile core, first of all. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that, that is something you, you, you should also check when you work with vendors uh, and, and you choose providers is um, who, who owns the mobile core? And mobile core is essentially a set of servers, software, should be these days anyway. Um, so for us, it's a um, fully cloud-native um, software stack, and um, we've deployed it on Amazon, we've deployed it in Virginia, we've deployed it in Frankfurt, Germany, and in uh, Sydney, Australia, with, with more to come. So now, um, based on where you find itself, of where you find yourself, you can activate different APNs, access point names, and thus get access to mobile cores that are local to you. So let's look at the situation with multi-MSI. Don't try to get a signal on T-Mobile, then fail, then switch to another one, etc. So choosing exactly which networks, plus some networks are more uh, costly than others. In the UK, for instance, um, there's a, a big carrier called EE, World, right? You get the simplicity, the coverage, and the network selectability, the multi-MSI approach. But you get the vendor independence, as long as you go with consumer profiles, of the ESO approach. So it's a good approach if you have, let's say, existing contracts, great relationships with certain large carriers, large um, carrier and carrier aggregators that we have relationships with. They, in turn, have roaming agreements with uh, local carriers. Right? So you could say a multi MZ SIM is a, um, a roaming, a SIM of roaming SIMs, if you like. But the key is that green network here can be accessed through, in this scenario, green MZ and red MZ. You actually fail over to another network in, a, in another situation, or is that a manual intervention scenario? Um, you got get very efficient operations, um, specifically through APIs, which will be that my next topic. Um, we're friendly folk, um, easy to access. Um, we help you, you know, free of charge to prototype, to test, to integrate. Um, you can actually get a free SIM um, and all of that pre-contract. And thanks. <clears throat> So let's dive into APIs. Guys, <laughs> how APIs support your business objectives, and the meat of my session will be in third part, characteristics of a great API and how to find one. In the, um, in the uh, abstract, I promised you 10 tips this is to embed SIM management in your workflows, leveraging APIs. So really the best SIM management solution makes managing 50,000 SIMs as easy and efficient as managing 50. Um, you can, you know, it, it can, it can uh, consume data, but we don't charge you for it yet. So the ready state is typically used for, uh, you know, right after 
your device has been manufactured, the SIM has been put into the device, and you're shipping um, to the end destination to your customer, and you don't want to pay for that, right? So we give you 250 kilobyte uh, free, we give you uh, 90 days, or troubleshooting, uh, the ability to pull lock files, um, you know, to have that deep visibility into what's going on. That's, by the way, another advantage of um, working with vendors that have their own mobile core is that you get a deeper insight into what's happening. Being able to reach a device proactively, you might sometimes need to push information to a device to update a rate table, for instance, if you have a connected postage printer or whatever the use case is. Um, APIs can help there as well. So typically um, you use VPNs or traditionally you use VPNs to, um, to give each device an IP and, and be able to reach it. But um, there's other ways um, such as an API that you could hit, a REST API um, to, to send information. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're looking at vendors um, for, uh, uh, you know, for, for SIM access, um, look, look for such capabilities as well. So these are the things, the features you can um, kind of leverage through APIs. Um, how do APIs help your business? Well, first, first of all, they enable that scalability, right? So um, at Twilio, the reason why we're so successful with startups is because they are digital natives, they get how to use APIs, make troubleshooting more transparent um, through something like event stream. Um, that can be a big plus on the customer experience side um, for you know you again, again in the role of I'm, I'm assuming I'm speaking to a room full of uh, entrepreneurs uh, and um, technologists that are either working at companies that do something like this or maybe uh, thinking about uh, building companies uh, in in these spaces. Um, so think about that. That right. Um, do a web search. Uh, for a feature to see whether the API documentation is on the first page of results. If it is, that tells you it's a page that developers actively use and that it's relevant enough for the search engine to highlight. For service level agreements, ask your vendor, do you offer SLAs that guarantee me the uptime and performance of the API themselves? Not just the uptime of my SIM, but the uptime of the API, because the API, once you've integrated it into your workflows, is crucial to running your business of their API. API should attract an active developer community. Ask your developers if they've ever heard of the vendor you're evaluating. Thank you so much, Tobias. <laughs> I have to admit, I love the tips. I, I think it's a great cheat sheet for a lot of your competitors. The one I think that's particularly mean is ask your developer have they heard of them? You know, <laughs> being the top dog in the industry, it's like, of course they've heard of you. <laughs> but any questions? You think that's why I put that one in? <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Go for it. Um, I think I didn't get the idea of having a twenty mobile core in three spots on, on the planet. Would that mobile core connect to the couple of hundreds of actually carriers? Deploy in the field to um, uh, video. Uh, so we also do high bandwidth um, use cases. So um, there's no kind of straight answer. It does add latency, but the overall latency is um, you know is is such that it supports most of the use cases out there. And uh, at the end of the day, it's up to you um, testing whether that's um, sufficient for your use case. Very typically, um, because we own the mobile core, and devices go through our mobile core um, <clears throat> uh, first and foremost. And the mobile core is not a monolithic thing, right? There's different servers and different functions involved. And we could, you know, uh, there's, there's actually a white paper we published about uh, mobile cores in general. So if you're interested in in that topic, I can. Um, send through the URL for that white paper or you Google it. Um, but um, we don't see developers needing more access than what we provide, which is, you know, let me control which SIM gets uh, gets to connect to which network where, 
um, let me control, let me um, see. Uh, if you look at the event stream API that we have, you get a lot of metadata around each sim. Uh, latitude and longitude of the cell tower it's connected to, um, start time of the data session, end time of the data session, uh, bytes consumed, um, things like that. So uh, radio access type. Um, so I'd encourage you to look at our documentation, which is public, and and see if um, if you're missing anything. But from my experience, um, since we already provide more than typical um, vendors in the space, no, they don't they don't want even more. Cool. That's excellent and clear. Thanks, Tobias. So again, round of applause for an excellent presentation. <laughs> excellent work. Thank you, Tobias. So pleased that you found. Thank you, guys. So yeah, I know, right? Have a great rest of the day, guys. Excellent. Okay, Vish, we are over to you. Great. Can you see me? Hey, we're just waiting for Tobias to take the share off. I can hear you, we can't see you. Okay, let's see what's going on here. Um, oh, here we go. We can see you. Excellent. Thanks so much for giving us a little Go again. No, I said lovely. I'm glad you guys can see me. <laughs> okay, so uh, Tobias, if you could close down so we can get Vish on the full screen. Oh, he's obviously muted himself. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, are my slides? The uh, presentation screen. Mm -hmm. oh, I see. But yeah, this is. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not letting me share my entire screen. Okay, well, I apologize for all of this. Let's see. I'll try this again. Oh, is that? No, same thing again. And how about this? Is this? No, same thing. Why isn't it sharing? I mean, it's it's okay. You know what? I did send my slides over if you wanted to share them, I can maybe just uh, talk to the, to the slides. Yeah, just hang a sec, let me just escape. Oh. Do you know how it is? Let me connect, disconnect you from the TV for a sec. And find where I've got them. solve all of the world's needs. Um, you know, the reality of it has, has been somewhat underwhelming and um, certainly, you know, kind of the visions of, of the private cellular market developing and, um, you know, the, the, the low latency network slicing capability. Uh, we give a, a fairly simplistic outline of um, different cellular generations from 3G to 4G to 5G. Uh, you know, I find it particularly illustrative to, to look at each of these technologies through the lens of its business model. Um, you know, namely, what value is being created? Smartphone appeared, you know, it's iconic. Uh, iPhone suddenly hits the market in 2007, um, a couple of years prior to the deployment of 4G. Uh, and really, the, the name of the game for a lot of the carriers were around data plans and monetizing the increase. Not many are experiencing some dramatic new experience as a result of it. Well, importantly, taking a look at this market again, you know, 5G relative to, to 4G and 3G really comes at a time when a lot of starts and stops, starting with for a small enterprise. Uh, there, there are, there is evidence that, you know, there's across these private spaces, and simply because, you know, most of those services aren't available today. You don't have um, ultra-reliable low latency, you don't have network slicing infrastructure. But the one that's really emerging, um, that seems to be getting a lot of traction, particularly with the emergence of a lightly licensed spectrum like CBRS in the US and um, obviously other geographies have picked up um, similar types of spectrum as a, as a function of their regulatory bodies, is this neutral host, this ability to have you know, spectrum um, that can be shared across multiple operators. And why is this helping us to address cost? It's really applying the principle of operating leverage to there's, there's, there's a break-even point. Uh, 
um, and it's the scale operation that we're, we're looking to see if the industry can achieve. I think the table will be set uh, when we when we kind of truly get this, um, you know, kind of running at full tilt. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so I, I did want to have a, you know, kind of a quick thought around, you know, what are some of these applications and when can they come and you know, how should we actually start to, to tease our head around the reality of 5G? And I, I like the, the Carlota Perez innovation model for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, you know, she describes a you know, kind of a, a view as to how technology diffuses uh, through a particular society. And um, you know, writ large, Carlota talks about this as technology revolutions that span 30 year increments. You could equally compact that down and you typically have a turning point in the industry uh, that happens you know, after around five years. So we haven't hit the turning point. We're still on this ups. You know, I think the seeds for where it could go um, are here today and always present in the present. Um, but it's trying to understand how are they going to extrapolate into uh, this golden age. So if we go to the next slide, Alan, a peak shipment of robots into um, the automotive <coughs> industry and, and non-automotive. The, the thing to look at in order to understand well, where are things going is, you know, take a look at the geographies where the density of robots are the highest. Um, and those tend to be you know, areas like Germany, Japan, Korea, uh, tend to have high uh, industrial automation, largely delivered on the back of, um, you know, the automotive industry, but you know, very quickly it's catching up in you know, the electronic component industry as well. So what I've shown here is a view about um, industrial robot density, uh, average across the world, you know, per 10,000 workers. And then I took a look at the best. Um, so this would be you know, areas like Japan and, 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 uh, and Germany. And so you can see that there's a potential here um, with where the rest of the world can catch up. Um, you know, I took a, a look also at the auto industry and the non-auto industry. You can see that the auto industry is heavily roboticized. Um, you know, really take root. Companies like Siemens with Mindsphere are also, you know, looking to, to get into the common control and the IoT digital twin space. Um, this is a real thing. It, it, it is, you know, very markety to talk about them. But when we take a look at deployments, there is a fairly steep trajectory. Um, once the robots have been deployed, it's really a matter of can we connect them. The thing that throws fuel on the fire of industrial automation is really a number of uh, technologies that are already on hand. Um, you know, I, which particularly, you know, in the geopolitical space that we have today, a lot of sovereign means of delivery is starting to become important for um, certain nation states. And uh, you are seeing a trend where near sharing and onshoring is, is becoming a real thing that's really being catapulted by uh, the ability to do um, you know, this, this level of automation with you know, technologies like AI and ML. The other big thing is oh, the precision. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Bishop. If you could just wrap yeah. up, please. We're just coming up on time. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. Great. Well, let me, let me just uh, park on that one then um, and go to the next slide just on planetary connectivity. And maybe I'll end on this. Um, so a lot of the uh, the NTN, um, you know, kind of the announcements are starting to hit the, the headlines. Um, many people would have heard about the T-Mobile and SpaceX uh, opportunity that uh, was recently announced, at t and Vodafone. Uh, I've been working with AST Space Mobile. Um, you know, the, the difference between, you know, prior generations of integration with satellites, we are seeing some good response times with the advent of Edge, um, but using a, a RAM protocol that gets tunneled through to the packet core, uh, and most of the systems haven't implemented something called local breakout. So there's a lot of technologies that need to be deployed for these things to, to, to really take hold. Um, we are seeing good network jitter, but um, there's reasons to believe that both AR, VR, and gaming um, could be a reality if the density um, and the plumbing for these edge nodes you know, become a reality. Um, and certainly that's just a function of time. So I would, I would submit these are the three. We're getting directly to the agenda. I need to. Okay. We're at Mac. This generation doesn't have ports. 
around from Vonage, I think. And so find something else to help your customers. But that's neither here nor there. Just that most of what we do is very linear. I place a phone call, hopefully it works, a phone rings, someone picks up and we talk to each other. And we've all been discussing much of this over the last few sessions. But what if we looked at some interesting data from research? By 2024, over 30% of customers are going to expect communication of customers, team, or whatever, before we go there. there are, such as the case studies, we'll see later. But first of all, a few things uh, that are going to come back later. All of the projects that we work on and we're going to see today hinge on not, no, no, no code. So this is all very low level stuff, which is my favorite project to hold for. While it's at the, it's not even the white paper, they're doing studies now, but it's going to be in their video room if I you. Plus, screenshots from the MCU are included in the signature package. And all the recordings are stored for legal review. So it all hinges around having an MCU, that MTP, that wasn't my phone, that wasn't me, all things people have said. Ultimately, and then I'll switch to the other case, uh, a signature on a contract is only valid until someone says it's not. So all you need to, what these people will, are trying to do and they're doing is proving that uh, making it impossible to already need on a signature, which is the most important thing. Because usually if I have a contract with him and we both oblige on what the contract said, we will never challenge the signature. Point is, I say you owe me $100 and you say uh, you don't, we'll have to figure out what, who's right. Cool, so online webinars. This is another interesting use case. It's quizzes. The speaker can also pull up a quiz, and that has to happen when they say they do. Like, here, please answer these three questions. It will make no sense for people if they didn't get it at the right moment. So in this case, more like whoever to see is the important part. Always keep in mind, whoever to see more or less guarantees the timing of what's happening during the conference. So what they use here is they use whoever to see to provide an experience that feels like it's live, even if it's not. It feels like it's live because you cannot speak to the speaker anyways, because there is only one way. So it's, oh, it's the same thing as being live. No people can really tell. I don't even know if they tell people. <laughs> it might, might very well be there's just an event. They don't tell you if it's recorded or not. So celebrity meeting app. This is another interesting use case that mostly, uh, so uh, what we do, uh, it's an up upcoming product we're building with a large uh, sports uh, organization, <laughs> which I can't say the name of. Uh, it involves balls but they all do so. Uh, so what, what the idea is to meet celebrities, uh, well, sports people, before and after the game for a few minutes where you're allowed to ask a couple questions. Most of the people are just a passive audience, but one of the one or two of the people in the audience or nobody's naked or, or has a sign saying something. But this is the idea. So this kind of application has a few challenges. Mostly scale. People watching these will be thousands, tens of thousands. One, one quick demo we did, like 300, 3,000 people watching in a few minutes, just because it's so new. As soon as something like that hits Twitter for whatever team, you're get, you get sworn. There, there's a lot of traffic. So the challenges here are mostly in scale, and that's why I say many times you should look at cloud first. It's not always the solution, and, but please take a look at cloud solutions first. Happening. This might sound silly, but I'm always about 90%. That's more of a personally tied thing. So some people might have a bad voice to start with, which is, but what they do is they detect decline. So I call you today, your average is 90%. Call you tomorrow, your average is 84%. I call you in five days, your average is 80%. That people seem to be very happy about getting those calls for the chatbots, because as you all know, OpenAI and a couple of other engines are really good. In population, and especially among us, build the more developer-oriented platforms. Make sure you have features like that, because it will come handy in the future. Of course, this could include video. Well, possibilities are endless. Do sentiment analysis on the video. So you, if the person looks destitute or looks better or whatever, they look happy or not happy, could do a lot of things. The challenge with video is that it's hard to synthesize a person talking to, to them. So audio is easier because you don't need the visual. How do a, a chatbot, it's hard to make to give a face to a chatbot. It's not, it could be done, but it's a lot of more work. So, well, single word. Hi, Alan. 
We're going to be we're for, running for about Euro, twenty Euro, minutes late, okay? So we've got Jerry. Yeah, yeah. So just you know, call back in in about twenty, and that'll be perfect, okay? All right. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Stop recording. With recording is on. Who the company is. So, uh, Live Switch, uh, we were founded in 2008. I started it with my brother. Uh, back then, some of you actually, uh, I know, uh, for example, I know Aaron over at WRC Ventures and so on. Uh, and I, I know a few of you probably know me. Uh, we were known as Frozen Mountain back then. Uh, we we rebranded uh, about two years ago now, give or take. Uh, kind of realized that Frozen might not be the best name to be using when you're talking about video. Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, we have offices in Vancouver. That's where I am. Down in Raleigh, North Carolina, we have our kind of our sales and operating. Uh, we're not going to compete with that. We're going to instead uh, jump on that train. So we actually launched the first SDKs for iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac, the native SDKs that were interoperable with the browsers. Uh, it was very much the right place, right time. We already had the SDKs written aside from uh, the actual codecs themselves. Everything else was uh, we picked was the same, stun, turn, so on. So let me tell you a story, all right? Year's 2020, COVID's running rampant. Uh, the WWE has come to us our, uh, through a partner of ours, the Famous Group, which is a production company. And they came to us with a bit of a problem that the stadiums had been shut down. You know, and this is, uh, this is an entertainment group, right? Like, so what are they, <laughs> what are they gonna do? Um, the WWE itself wasn't shut down, right? I mean, they still had a business to run, so, but they couldn't actually bring their fans in. And the wrestlers were actually talk, talk, telling them, hey, you know, we can't actually do this without an audience. Uh, you know, they're, they're entertainers, they're true entertainers, right? Uh, if you've ever watched one of these events, I, I can't claim to be a huge WWE fan, but it is fascinating to watch. They're putting on a show, right? And you can't have a show without an audience. Like, it just doesn't work. Uh, you know, there were a bunch of uh, late night uh, uh, show hosts as well that were facing the same problem. So. They would have a you know a giant slam would happen on the mat and the crowd goes, right? So you understand that there's a bit of a challenge here. So they, just, they came to us and they said, okay, well, what can we do? What what is what are our options? And really, what we decided was let's let's just bring the audience in remotely. Let's let's bring them in from their homes and put them in the stadium. <laughs> So here's here's some of the, the pieces that ended up getting involved, okay? And, and I'm gonna actually, we're gonna, I'm, I'm starting with the solution and we're gonna back into some of the problems that, that we hit along the way here. So obviously we've got live switch. Uh, we're, prob we're providing high scale, high quality, uh, bi-directional video streaming. So this was bringing the um, production feed from actually in the stadium to the audience members at home and then for the audience members at home, bringing them in as fans. And the whole thing had to happen in, you know, 250 milliseconds at the outside. Uh, we were aiming for, for lower, there's some production overhead. Uh, the famous group, who is the, the actual production partner, these are the guys that are in the arena doing the actual, you know, putting up the, uh, the actual screens and so on. Uh, Amazon, we had an infrastructure provider in this case that was partnering with us. Amazon was, was the infrastructure provider. We'll go into that. They weren't initially. Um, and then of course, we had to bring that, that production quality feed to the fans. So that, that was already an interesting challenge, right? This isn't just a video conference now. Now you're talking about high motion, uh, lots of different types of activities, you know, like confetti kind of things happening. Um, High quality audio. So this isn't just a this isn't a video conference kind of application, right? Like this has to be a very high end, high quality feed. It's a production feed, right? Like this is a TV show, um, and it had to be bidirectional, and it had to be you know, two hundred milliseconds. So problems we ran into. <laughs> I don't have any database gurus on staff. Uh, like I've got database guys. <laughs> I don't know, within the audience here, I don't know who is the database guy and who has the database guy. I've got a database guy. 
he's good. Uh, but you guys have all worked with those guys that are like the database wizards, right? Like they can do anything. Like, yeah, I don't have one of those. <laughs> so we, we've got enough, you know, to, to manage the database to, to write some 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 SQL. But you know, the throughput of the Thunderdome event is a little higher than normal. Uh, I also don't have any Kubernetes gurus on staff. Again, I've got a guy who does our Kubernetes management. He's good, right? Like he's, he's a very talented guy. Um, but he's not like Kubernetes wasn't his his you know, major in college, as it were, right? Like that's not what he did. Uh, so we're dealing with okay, we we're, we lack a little bit of knowledge, um, and then we had to to deal with the fact that you know, quite frankly, uh, you know, scaling real time video streaming to those kind of volumes is, is hard. You know, um, I'm sure many of you in this in this audience know some of the challenges that you run into when when you're trying to scale WebRTC, right? Um, so we had some clustering algorithms and so on, um, and we ran into some very interesting challenges with that, which I'll, I'll get into here in a second. So our first version of this, uh, just just to put this in context, we got a contract to go and make this happen with a go live date of 19 days. So we went from this is an idea to this is live in 19 days, and we. We did it, okay? So <laughs> anytime I'm telling you that, you know, the first version and the second version and the third version, that's because the first version was 19 days from, from date of contract. <laughs> so I'm sure you guys know how that works. All right, the first version. I'm not gonna name the infrastructure provider, uh, but it was a disaster. Uh, like they were just, it was it was painful. We tried using a bunch of their automation tools and none of them worked. Uh, we couldn't get Firewall settings to, to work properly, just complete fiasco. We finally managed to get it all done by manually setting everything up. Like we just manually fired up all of the individual servers, set them up all individually. Cloning didn't work, so we couldn't clone the VM and, and recreate it. Like it was just complete fiasco. Uh, so we manually set up every single individual server, fired them all up ran the first Friday show, and I would say it was a success. Barely. <laughs> so, we were manually running a lot of extra servers, we had way more overhead than we needed, uh, not sustainable, not repeatable, uh, we had uh, some, you know, we had our, our internal stats that monitor all of our services, we, we saw all kinds of unusual loss happening on the network between our servers as they were clustering with each other, just uh, uh, honestly, uh, it was amazing that it worked. Uh, but we did sit, nevertheless still end up with you know something like a 98% connection rate. Uh, some of the quality suffered a little bit due to that loss that was happening inside the inside the infrastructure. So that was on a Friday night. So Saturday came by, and we're like, oh, this is not going to work in the long run. Uh, you know, the WWE is a very uh, demanding customer. They monitor all of their social networks. The moment anybody complains about anything on Twitter or whatever, they hear about it, and then we heard about it. So it was a, it was a, a unique environment. So we realized that the infrastructure that we had uh, was not sustainable, and we said, okay, well, let's let's swap it over so we can just eliminate that as a as a question here. So we moved over to Amazon on EC2. Uh, still manually set up, still manually managed, all manually turned down, costs were definitely still high, but by Monday, uh, the, the Monday evening show, we had our second environment set up and tested on, basically we tested it late over Sunday night into Monday morning, validated it fin for the final show Monday early, probably about 8 a.m., and then we had that sh the show that night. Uh, so that, that actually was quite successful. So the, that was our day two launch, basically. At that point, the, the number of complaints that we kind of saw on the social media side from the WWE fans dropped significantly, and they were, you know, basically the, the fans had kind of turned around and said, holy crap, this is, this is crazy, this is awesome, look at me, I'm on TV, All right? Uh, so we were manually running a whole bunch of Docker containers, right? So we had EC2 servers, and we were just like firing up, manually firing up Docker containers. Uh, no auto scaling again, uh, so lots of extra servers running. Over the next few months, we polished it up a lot. Uh, 
we did 107 shows with the WWE, uh, bringing thousands of fans into their into their stadium every night. It was 100, it was 104, 107, something like that. Uh, so two to three, to even four times a week, we were bringing bringing those thousands of fans in uh, into their stadium. In our final version, it was EKS uh, with managed services for our uh, database, for our Redis cluster, for. Uh, our auto scaling, the whole thing was managed in, in the long run. Uh, so the whole system was automated, deployed ma uh, automatically, managed automatically, scaled automatically, fired up appropriately before the event, and automatically shut down after. In case anybody's thinking, oh yeah, okay, WWE, interesting use case, but it's a little, it's a little funny, you know, it's a little odd. Uh, yeah, probably. It's it's certainly one off for COVID. I don't see the the level of this fan experience continuing, and I'll show you a video here in a moment what it actually looked like. Um, but I also do want to call out that we received back uh, an email from one of their fans uh, who, uh, because he was able to be a part of this, he part, he took part in something like ninety something of the hundred and odd, hundred and four odd, hundred seven odd shows that we did. Um, and he sent them a note after they shut it down and said, just wanted to let you know that uh, I was super depressed during COVID because I wasn't able to see anybody. I was contemplating suicide and I didn't because I was able to be a part of this. So anytime somebody says, oh, well, you know, what you're doing is, is you know, it's just entertainment or whatever. And, uh, to me, that's, that's making a pretty big difference. It's literally saved somebody's life. So uh, with that, I'm going to, Pull up the video here so you guys can actually see what this looked like in reality. Can you guys hear that? Can I get yeah. some sort of a yeah. confirmation? Yeah, can you yeah. hear? We can hear. actually see that in the Golden State Warriors every night whenever they play they've got that virtual fan wall in there um, that's powered by live switch that that's a web RTC feed showing up there live uh, dedicated fan meeting rooms we did this with Formula One uh, the the locker room to court the, the walkout experience where the the um, the players run out of the locker room and they go onto the court those fan walls uh, we've got a couple of those jumbo in your pocket. You, if you haven't seen one of those yet, you haven't been to uh, to a game yet, right? Where they're uh, firing up, you can you can grab your camera, put yourself up on the on the jumbo tron. That's actually done with WebRTC. Uh, meeting of your favorite player, like high end experiences. They're doing those now, where you can actually have a, a you know a minute to actually chat with you know whoever it is that you you're a fan of in your in your favorite uh, you know sport. Whatever that happens to be, and of course, you know, there's there's merchandising that's being thrown through the whole thing from the monetization standpoint, and tickets, and uh, and so on. So people are actually monetizing this as well. I don't see, by the way, uh, that full blown experience that we saw with the Thunderdome going on uh, post post COVID. Uh, I do see the hybrid experiences. There's a lot of that happening. A lot of really interesting. That was excellent. So Thank you so much, Jared. Do any questions 
Councillor Jarrett, please. At the back, Aaron. Uh, Jared, I'd like to know when you start doing WWE in the metaverse, will that make the wrestling real? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. If you virtualize something that's fake, does it does it invert? <laughs> <laughs> Any oh, you want yeah, of course, go for it. Oh, uh, no. I do have a more serious question. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to hear more about how you scale across all of the screens in the stadium there, if there's anything that you can say about how you did like the groupings of that or that scaling. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. So uh, we did run into some interesting challenges there. The uh, inside a production studio like that at, at, a, at, a, um, at a venue, there's limits because we can't actually take, you know, thousands of remote feeds into the production studio like it's straight up not designed to do that and that's hardware right like they can't just upgrade software to get support for thousands of feeds like that uh, so what we ended up doing was we actually uh, live switch has a mix mode or mixer mode so we have all of the fans coming in and we mix them into chunks so we, we group them into into bigger groups of i think about 25 or 30 people uh, and we we brought those mixes in, and we put them into the into the production house, and then we actually used Unreal to Unreal, the Unreal Engine to to rip them apart um, and kind of regroup them. That that wall that you saw in the video where they were kind of sliding things back and forth, um, that UI was built in Unreal, and they they could pick different areas and basically un. We would mix it together, and they would slice it back apart, and then they would distribute it up to the uh, up to the LED TVs. And Jared, what resolution were they putting the fans <coughs> on the uh, in stadium TVs at? Was it just like you know uh, definition? They or? were well, it, yeah, it was it was it was SD. They okay. were about six forty by four eighty, most of them. Okay, and then yeah. what were you pumping out to fans? Was that just HD, or were you doing four K? It was. It was a, a 4K feed running at about, it, let me, it was a 4K input resolution, yeah. let me put it that way. Um, and it was being broadcast at a couple of tiers. Yeah. So we actually had a, you know multiple bit rates. Um, the high end bit rate was about, uh, I think it was about eight megabits per second. And then the low end was, was closer to two. And they basically said, we don't, you know, if, if you can't sustain two, they didn't want it. Yeah. Motion resolution would be just a problem. Yeah, yeah, it was actually pretty bad at two, to be honest. It, it, it really needed the high end to, to keep up with the, uh, the the amount of action that was happening. Gotcha. Any other questions? If not, again, that was excellent. Thank you so much, Joe. That was really interesting. Excellent. Dinesh, I can see you there. It's now over to you. Yeah, it's there. Just waiting for you to unmute your video. There you go. All right. I'm good. You share my screen. Let me know that when you see it. Yeah, I will do it. All right. <coughs> okay. Yeah, we can see your screen. Then just go into there. You go. Perfect. Excellent. So Dinesh has been with us since the beginning. So uh, when I showed that picture from uh, uh, Bangkok in 2013, one of the audience members, as I pointed out, was Dinesh. So we're happy to have Dinesh here and we'll be presenting on Don't Ask Your Developer. So Dinesh, over to you. All right. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Uh, morning. I'm, I'm actually, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm in the Bay Area in San Francisco right now, and uh, uh, welcome to all of you for the Tech Summit 2022. As Alan mentioned, um, we have been actually been with Tech Summit from day one. I think from Bangkok, I think Alan we started, and then we actually it's been a it's been a great uh, journey all this time. So just to give you a quick background of myself, I'm actually the founder CEO of Senate Mobile. Uh, mostly focusing on messaging platforms, uh, CPaaS, uh, um, uh, doing quite a lot of things in the AI ML area. Today we're going to talk about don't ask your developer. 
So just uh, you can see my screen, right, Alan? Yep. All right. Yeah. So coming back, um, I think we are in a very, very interesting time frame right now. I think uh, if you really look at what happened with the uh, uh, from the Industrial Revolution 3.0 to uh, 4.0, we are jumping into an area of what we call a complete digital transformation. I think all of you, I think we all realize that I think it actually accelerated with the pandemic. And um, this is like actually going from a butterfly, from a, uh, going from a cocoon to a, a chrysalis into a butterfly, that whole journey. And that journey can take you know, to become a butterfly it could be seven to 14 days or it could be even three to four months if the environment is not suited for it to kind of come out as a butterfly so i think that's the phase that we are in currently and as telcos i feel that you know there is definitely a opportunity now uh, with what happened with the pandemic and with you know the the complete change to be able to take advantage of your assets to be brought up and opening the assets, you know, previously from service delivery platforms to making into CPaaS, now we see that it's actually moving and converging with enterprises and payments and bringing those out as uh, uh, tools for enterprises to be able to build uh, applications on that. So we call this APIs for everyone. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, you are now able, you don't need to be a a developer to be able to build products and bring to market. So I think this is going to be the key revolution we see that will happen in the next uh, decade. I think I'll go back to this, you know, see what the business opportunity is. But if you really look at um, this had kind of an accelerator during the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic that we all went through. So what happens? The, the, the global API market, it's going to be close to a billion dollars and it's been growing at a CAGA of 23% um, year over year. And um, we uh, from Atelgo and the Korea industries are, are here to kind of uh, be able to take this and build on what we have and create that as tool set for enterprises to be able to bring this to uh, their own customers to be bring this out as a uh, platform for that. So what happened during the thing, you know, so all companies started uh, doing this because uh, during the pandemic time, whether it's marketing updates, reminders, uh, change updates, virtual assistants, OTP, all that really kind of uh, accelerated during the, uh, again, during the pandemic time and if you, you know, because of the scarcity of resources, a lot of enterprises started to be able to do this through uh, building their own internal systems. And we saw that, you know, especially in Asia, in the Asian market, that enterprises were had no choices but actually to be able to kind of do this. And um, telecom operators or the couriers had the experience of kind of uh, bringing this tool set to market and allowing this to happen. So if you really look at the APEC um, telco market, it has an ideal opportunity because we see this as a real growth in, in time to come. And part of this is that we are seeing that enterprises are merging, the ecosystems are getting built now, they are opening the APIs, the telco APIs on one side, enterprise APIs, then you have the payment APIs that are coming, whether it's kind of a connecting into the payment gateways and opening that up, whether it's wallets that are getting opened up, and all once we have this ecosystem getting built, enterprises that had to go to your developers and ask um, to develop things, now they can do to their own business units. So we saw that happening in Philippines, in Singapore, in Sri Lanka, we saw lot of these enterprises building this and bringing that to market. So this is where we see that the, the huge growth that we are thinking we will come up will actually come up uh, through the uh, telcos bring, bringing uh, or the couriers bringing this up. And the key again 
is simplicity, right? So simplicity is, you know, being able to uh, early, I, I'll take you through a video of how it was, you know, a few years back and how it has changed even to that. So telcos being able to open their APIs, mesh it with some of the enterprise APIs, and then bring some of the payment APIs, be able to kind of go to market in a very timely manner. If you really look at, if uh, if we need to kind of build a application that needs um, instant um, information that is needed, whether it's a FMCG or uh, whether it's a financial institute, the time it takes from an idea to come out it would used to be you know, six to nine months. Now they want to try this out in a control environment, you can actually try something out within weeks. If that is working well, then you scale up and you, you do the complete rollout. So we saw uh, both FMCG companies as well as financial institutions trying this in a control environment and bringing this out to the market. So we feel that that's one of the key areas in that. So this is, for careers, this is a billion dollar opportunity. Uh, it's, it's why we call it a billion dollar opportunity, a new revenue opportunity, is that now you have the ability, I think it got accelerated, the digital transformation got accelerated through the pandemic and now you are actually being able to bring this to the um, enterprise market, you know, even SMBs now, you know, I mean, earlier you used to have armies of developers with the uh, larger enterprises, but now you can actually bring this to the MSMEs or SMEs to be, bring these solutions to market very, very fast. So what were some of the challenges with the last, I mean, we, we all know this, right? I mean, the coding skills were needed, market, you know, keeping the right first to enter market was an advantage, but you couldn't do it because it was taking so long to do that. Lengthy and development cycles, you know, with current, you know, CICD and some of the DevOps operations now actually through your low code, no code, you can actually go to market even faster than that. And there was a lot of high dependency with IT teams. So those, you know, uh, were, were some of the barriers for that, but helping the, the real success to, for a, a formula for success is that building this non-developers to create and deploy services to increase innovative capabilities or services that can be brought to market as fast as possible. So that's what we saw. And this is how the, the no code, low code technology started coming in. According to Gartner, you know, it had been growing at 23% uh, during the pandemic. And I think it, it, it's not a secret for all of us, right? I mean, we did not have um, time to kind of uh, sit down and do lengthy, uh, discussions you know you know something needed to be done it was done two-factor authentications came overnight you know we saw zoom uh, google meets and others became overnight and uh, uh, bring bring up uh, both telco and enterprise applications to market much faster so the key i'm going to use a couple of things i think you know the allow telcos to identify full potential of their current telco assets that's what they were doing before now they can actually start um, not only to monetize them, but also merge or to mesh them with some of the payment APIs, payment wallets, and also with entirely that can be trained and learned, and you don't need to have a, a significant uh, experience in kind of uh, uh, building this because the you know, the backend started kind of uh, being able to do that. So that uh, unleashing that power of uh, uh, being able to be a billion dollar industry for the telcos for in, in the Asian region is very much. We have, you know, if you need further information, you can go to the senatemobile.com uh, site and we have a white paper. We, have, we go into a little bit more detail about it, you know, how I, and, and uh, talk about this. So you can just download that. And uh, if there's any questions, I'll be willing to answer that right now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dinesh. Any questions for Dinesh? I really do particularly like the don't ask your developer. You know, where <laughs> we're there. That's quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is Sebastian still here? Uh, he was. I need to speak to him.
Yeah, maybe downstairs. Damn. Oh. So, uh, just I think. Yeah, uh, Sebastian actually, Alan was actually, he did one last year, right, in the same area. And I think. Uh, uh, what he talked about, the billion dollar industry actually came from one of the, some of the stuff that he talked about and we started doing that and that was actually so, Sebastian was, was a, a catalyst in, you know, uh, some of this also, you know. That's right, because he shared this uh, morning his experiences with uh, Deutsche Telekom's second attempt at launching a CPAS. I was just going to ask, as he decided to copy some of your work in terms of low code, no code, but uh, he's not. Is Martin here? No. It's getting to the end of the day. But anyway, that was really good. Enjoy that, Dinesh. I think it's a very timely uh, presentation. Uh, and again, you know, just, I know it's a bit of an inside you know, industry joke, but you know, the title of the uh, white paper in Don't Ask Your Developer is very smart. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. All right. Bye -bye. right now, Cola became tentative um, because uh, he's got some internal stuff he's having to deal with. I don't see him here. Okay, I'm, no, he's gone. Okay, so I'm assuming the last presentation isn't happening because we're late and he should be, you know, he should be on the bridge. So we've just got uh, your one. Now, this isn't officially part of the agenda, but because Luke is here, because he does Cluke on there, he says it has nothing to do with signal wire or free switch. But, you know, I go, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, <laughs> come up and uh, do your piece, okay? Yes. Very short. podcast that I've been doing for, for a long time now. I picked up uh, someone who you might know, Click and Weekly, from David Duffett, who made it a great event that it is, but I picked it up from, I think it's a couple years ago, and it's been funny, and we've been taking it in a few more directions, so I thought I'd just do a super quick presentation about what Click and Weekly is. It's a weekly podcast about uh, open source entrepreneurship. Uh, we published every week, and we are uh, in the eleventh year with software development. I've been trying to broaden the audience as much as possible and the topics as much as possible. But like I asked Alan, and it was very gracious in that meeting. The uh, this quick presentation and some numbers from last year. We had forty-six episodes. Uh, Eleven were about open source projects. We had we featured twelve companies, uh, seven corporation employees. So people who work in large carps like Cisco and came to talk about the specific aspect of the technology. Uh, five non-profit organizations, people who run standards or what well, we even standard office, but people who, for example, we had a very uh, important person, uh, a guy from New Zealand, who uh, spoke about, uh, is uh, the chairman of uh, an association specializing in uh, uh, visual impaired technology, like people, technology for visually impaired people, it was very interesting. Five new profits, uh, four independent developers, people would just have something interesting to say. I just did a fantastic interview with uh, a developer of the visual system that almost any car has now that uh, tracks uh, speed signs and all other signs in the road and tell the, you know, tells you how it works, and it was super interesting. Four standard authors, Tim Penton, other people from, uh, from the industry, and one lawyer. <laughs> Which is, I know it stands out, but uh, when I counted the episodes, I realized I was missing one, and I, was, I, I couldn't find out with the last one, and then I realized it was a lawyer. So she was a very smart woman we met, and uh, she, she helped, uh, to, well, the, the chat was about open source licensing. So there's a lot for everybody, because especially licensing in the open source world, people just pick, you know, we're going to do MIT, why? Because we like the name, it's MIT, so it's cool. And people don't really know if it's the right license, they just do it, right? So, what are we looking for? Uh, more open source projects. Don't be shy, people from the sub features uh, project. I just name drop one at random. There's no, no particular. There's no particular meaning in this. Just saying. Just saying. 
uh, VC and capital investment experts not to buy out the podcast. It's not, so if you want to talk, I mean, I'm here, but <laughs> <laughs> it's valued at a couple billion dollars, so it's going to be a hard discussion. Uh, yeah, if someone joined, I'd really like to, uh, if anybody has experience in markets and, uh, you know, mergers and acquisition, uh, large companies buying out smaller companies, merging projects, that kind of stuff, we haven't featured that in a while, and it will be really interesting if you could have someone, because that helps startups. We all make money out of big corporate contracts, but we all want to hit, also hit as salespeople. We also want to hit the small startup that becomes a unicorn. So we need to help them do that. That's why I think the ecosystem is important and everybody should try to do their own part. It'll always come back, comes back. Right? Every time I try to put two people at Tokyo to help each other in touch, it resulted in something good. And sometimes it even came back to me in some form, business or just friendship or invites to a conference or, or drinks which are very valuable, especially <laughs> if you're in the US where a cocktail is like $18 because they're crazy. Uh, market analysts, it would be very interesting to have the foremost uh, real-time communication market analyst uh, <laughs> feature in a segment. Yeah, happy to chat. No pressure, though, again, absolutely. And anyone who has a story to tell, so really this isn't a presentation, I just wanted to say, if anybody wants to join up, uh, of course, well, the podcast is sponsored by Singapore because they, they pay for their bandwidth and the, the production, but Tokyo Week has always been, always been separate, always will be, and we'll be featuring different sponsors too in the future, so that's just a, we're just trying to, to get it to go. Of course, the podcast needs some resources to run and to make it run better. We have a sponsor, but by no means, it's, a, it's meant to be open to everyone who wants to say something. Format is about half an hour of chat, and yeah, just... I mean, anybody want to join, just let me know and I'll be super happy. Excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for the time. Really was no, no, no. I'm sure it's so. So that's it. We're done. Thank you for staying all the way through to the end. That's amazing. Uh, so um, I'll be getting all this chopped up, published over the next week or so. So you'll be able to come in and what review all of it. Most of you have sent your slides through. If you haven't yet, please send them through and I'll get them up onto SlideShare so that, uh, again, people can look through your slides. And I would say that, that the slides tends to be the most popular thing. If I look at video views, you know, it'll be like, you'll know, see tens to maybe a hundred, uh, you know, by the end of the year. But slide views, they can be in the thousands. So uh, definitely, it's a great way to communicate your uh, ideas because it's quick. People can look in, race through your slides, and within a couple of minutes, know what you were saying. So just to let you know, these slides are important. So Grim, safe travels back home, and uh, you know, if you're interested in providing a home for Tad Summit next year, please let me know. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Take care. <laughs>
Absolutely. Yeah. Just remember now yeah. they keep you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll end up with the fairies under the bridge. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's really strange when you say that and you don't know the Isle of Man. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Like, um, <laughs> you Why are you insulting the Pearl Marker? So, I, how is the Isle of Man at the moment? Too bad. I think it's, yeah, is it still paranoid over COVID or is it going over that? Uh, no, I think it's pretty yeah, over. I mean, it's, yeah, like everywhere else. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 I guess it, my lens is through my parents and they're all. Yeah, no, I think the old, the old generation generally are still, you know, 
paranoid about it. Yeah. Quite well, but, yes, yeah. no. I mean, you've got the, yeah. I mean, it's endemic. There's no way you can run. No way yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. take care. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. Oh, See you. Yeah. Absolutely. Take care. Take care. Yeah. Thanks again for an excellent presentation. Adam. Thank you. Good. 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 Did, I wasn't successful, so you know, I'll, I'll just guilt you a little bit more. And, uh, <laughs> and hopefully, it will come. Oh, it will. But yes, I'll let you know. Well, you, well, you're on me on my list. You can't escape me. I'll let you know for certain when we get things locked down. Okay.
Yeah, you, if you give them in the freezer, you know, yeah, they'll last a while. Yeah. Uh, like you guys said, the last time, everybody loved it. Yeah. Yeah. But as you said, it's a special. Everybody's plate is lost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I need to run down. Uh, I'll, I'll be around, so. Yeah, I know we can, you know, talk down for this. I'll just say bye bye for this. All right. Okay. Yep, no, we're all good. We're just getting everything to down. Yeah. Is it okay to leave that for you to dump? I don't yeah. know if you reuse them or whatever. Well, well we can reuse them if you don't want to take it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you can just leave it in the box. Exactly. Yeah, you just reuse the box. That's it, you can reuse the box. Yeah, 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 exactly. If we do that for our own. Okay, so I'll just leave it there. I'll leave the yeah, case that came in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll be appeared as well to help with having everything. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
as well as the other one, but I don't care about it. So so what I'm thinking is actually do we just develop against that that can then go on and what are the use cases of trying to build work across web? Well so this is the problem is that it's actually actually a Specific <laughs> 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 And uh, right. the, yeah, the clear. What's the plan for the meeting? Yeah. Yeah. I put that in the invitation if anybody has a place that they can do it. Please let us know. So, uh, yeah, we'll be yeah. out yeah. for a week. We'll get it down together and then I'll fire it off to a picture and see what they can do. It's like that, you know, I mean, you can see. You know, Joe, he's in your space, he's in the co-fixed but then, sorry, you were staying over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, just drive back to the hotel with the car and yeah, walk. That's the best thing to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do. So, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, are you, are you staying? Yeah, I'll be around this tonight. Yeah, yeah, I just got to get you know, all the videos transferred. Logistical yeah. card. Yeah. 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 Take care. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. I'll be around. 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 If people are in the bar, yeah, 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 yeah. all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's right. Thanks, man. We'll get you again. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Later. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. Oh, it's for booking. Right. Do you need some help with that? No, 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 no. It's just easy. Take care. It's just it's lots of video transfers that take ages. All right. Got gigabytes of data to transfer. No worries. I believe you need the helping hand or anything. Yeah, no problem. And also, I'm going to leave most of it for when I get home because the internet here in Elvira sucks. <laughs> sucks. Uh, you know, I, I, I did a um, speed test for the bill, you know, for the internet here, and it was like maybe 200 megabits by directional. So I was like, why the hell am I having so many problems with YouTube? <laughs> well, the ISP keeps limiting YouTube. Yeah. Right. yeah. No worries. No worries. Yeah. But anyway. And All right. right, excellent hey. presentation. Thank you really very much. See you later at the bar, probably. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Thank Thanks you. so much for joining us again. It's a pleasure coming. Over. And hopefully you'll present next, next time, you know? Next nice time. Nice meeting you. Yes. Yeah, next year. I we, have a, we have a startup in medical life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. cool. Yeah. 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 Actually, yeah. digital assistant yeah. stays in the room oh. between the doctor and the patient. Yeah, yeah. 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 maybe tomorrow. So oh, without catch up in the bar. Yeah, our doctor touching the keyboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an A behind it. Okay. Next year. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. No, with a really great presentation like you did. Yes. <laughs> it was a pleasure being here. And thank, you. thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. Great it's good to bring the community together, to have some fun, have a few drinks, yes. and That's eat great. some new food. I've never had here. Sort of Those are all the soft egg things. Those are cool. Those are cool. <laughs> they are yeah. so sweet. <laughs> yes. Now. <laughs> All right, cool. So okay, I'll leave you to to yeah, grab on no and, and then yeah, and then we'll catch up with the time for the next case. I mean, I said yeah. do that. It's it's yeah. good yeah. enough. Yeah. So yeah. unless you're trying to do something yeah. like stable, yeah. so yeah. 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 we'll come to the developer to use it. That's what I do. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Oh, you're trying to offer it as a capability. Yeah. yeah. So it's a capability. So people say we want in that message, and I say, oh, that's fine. We do have this simple message service. It supports this, this, and this. Okay. Well, I don't know. I just don't know. I have to know to know whether. I mean, it's that's popular. Yeah. It's popular. It's popular. It's popular. It all depends on how they're right. right. wanting to use it. Well, is actually the big issue that I've got. I still do it. I still do it. Chat. Still do it. Maybe do it one more round. Well, that's it. And I think the web chat has to be entirely different. Okay. Then it's okay. Because when you do it, yeah. Because you do it separately. Because the in-out messaging. You just have to accept that somebody might make it and then it 
close their app and then come back and exactly. you're being more persistent, but they're also logged in all the time, which you can't guarantee on the web chat. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah. So yeah. You know, as long as you take the separate use cases, then you're fine. That's fine. Okay. Don't worry about it. Cool. All right. That makes sense. No yeah, problem. Thanks for that. Yeah. All right. See you in the morning. Hey, thanks, thanks for, for everything. Oh, sure. Yeah. What little I did, but no, thank you. I enjoyed it. No, oh, I mean, it was like during the, uh, you know, the, that panel was such a difficult panel to put together. <laughs> oh, God. And then Tim was saying, oh, I hope it went well. <laughs> it was just like, oh, my God. So, but it was. I thought that. It was actually, a good discussion. It was a good discussion. Yeah. It was very relevant. Jared did a really good job. You did a good job. Nick played a role really well, yep. which was perfect. You know? yeah. She was like really nervous and the rest. And I think she realized, you know, you know her world war stories are relevant. Oh, yeah. Do that, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's just one of the marketing methods. Cool. So, uh, yeah. No, it was great. It was, and it was interesting also, like, you know, being in that role of moderating a hybrid plan, uh, panel, it gave me. It's a little like when, you know, if you work on call center software, you need to take some calls yes. every now and then, right? To understand what pain you're putting people through. That's right. <laughs> but it, it works out. Right, Everybody's so nervous about doing it with the panel. And yeah. As long as, you know, I mean, you've got to know how to use the tools and get it set up so the right. audio works. Right. As long as that works, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. And that's the hardest part. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it was fun. It's a great experience. Glad okay. I came. Thanks for giving me a great excuse to come to Fortune. And to a bureau, because it's not a place that many people go to. No, okay. Yeah, you know? yeah, agreed. I've been to this one a bunch of times. But over too many times, Paul, times. Paul, Jeff, too many times. But to uh, go to a bureau, which is like, you, know, you hear about it, and of course, you know, there's always these magical stories. So you're a bit like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like Dalai Man. People claim that Dalai Man is this amazing place to visit. It's like going back to the 1950s. I'm like, I'm sure we're going back to the 1950s. <laughs> but, you know, it's sort of position like that, you know, a bit oldie worldy. And then you know that most of it's just not. <laughs> but he's nice. I, you know, the front around, because uh, the, um, oh, the security guys were there last night. Uh, so they were down by the, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the, the seafront. Well, it's not seafront, the Lagoon yeah. front. And they ended up in a salsa dancing place. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> well. But it was full of old grannies dancing. <laughs> Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. No we were looking for Sebastian Schumann, but he disappeared. He disappeared, so I don't know what went on. I emailed him. Maybe he didn't see the email. He was downstairs uh, earlier because I saw him popping out. Yeah. Came on the call. Uh, maybe. Probably an issue. Well, uh, I'll get to him somehow. Well, well you've got his contact details, and he's uh, easy, relatively easy for a telco to get a contact. You know, so many people I know in telco where, Thank you, you know, unless you're directly in the line of sight that they need to talk oh, to, yeah. you don't exist. Yeah. Thanks okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Yep. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, not, we don't know one more run at the first one. Thank you. Uh, recommendation. Yeah. Um, I haven't been to, like, see a front area. I've just been okay. to the dogs. Yeah. Yeah. My wife and I are looking for a place to go to dinner tonight. Is there an like, area we should go to or a particular restaurant?